Welcome to our September full moon celebration. Thank you for joining us today to bring our wellness moonshot mission to life. As you might already know, the term moonshot originally came from President John F. Kennedy's mission to land a man on the moon in the 1960s. Our equally ambitious goal is to create a world free of preventable disease. As you, um, this, the Global Wellness Institute brings together many thought leaders and wellness pioneers that help us drive and shape this mission and the future of wellness. You might recognize some familiar faces here. This photo was taken at the launch of the Wellness Moonshot in 2017. Because expanding our reach is a top priority, we track our moonshot metrics closely. In the past month, we've grown by 192 individuals and organizations, bringing this number to 5,164 and impacting over 25,000 new people. And you can see the overall impact to globally individuals on the slide. The themes for the September Moonshot celebration are accomplish and be curious. I now have the pleasure to introduce you to someone incredibly accomplished, Nancy Davis, our Chief Creative Officer and Executive Director, who will lead you through the next hour. Hello, Nancy, over to you. Thank you so much, Jesse. Appreciate that. Hello, everyone, and thank you for being here. What if curiosity actually made the cat live longer? What if Curious George, that wonderful children's book character, was right when he said that with a little curiosity, you can do anything? What if curiosity really was the holy grail of good health? We are about to address these what ifs with our very special guest, Anna Bierstam. There is a reason Anna is the ideal person to be with us today. This month, the Wellness Moonshot theme, as Jesse mentioned, is Accomplish, and the children's theme is Be Curious. Anna embodies both of these themes perfectly. In business, she is an accomplished executive, leading a global team at Six Senses, helping to define the future of spa and wellness in the context of those extraordinary destinations. Anna also founded and led Raison d'Etre, developing spa brands for some of the most iconic hotels and resorts. Anna is a legend in the wellness world with the apt title of wellness pioneer. She is a founding board member of the Global Wellness Summit. She's a rock star when it comes to innovation and she leads with a strong sense of purpose and a kind and generous heart. Today, Anna is our raison d'etre. Anna, welcome. Oh my God, I don't really know how to answer that. That was like the most, uh, oh my God, I feel, now you got me all nervous with all those positive affirmations. I think they were slightly exaggerated. But, and I see also all these distinguished people. So now I'm getting even more nervous. Um, oh, because... nonsense. You needn't be nervous. You're a pro. You speak in front of groups all over the place. I know. But the good thing is, though, that stepping outside, this is kind of bordering. And we're going to talk about this a bit on curiosity, because it's not as easy as one think with curiosity. And we'll talk about that in a second. But being anxious, nervous, stepping outside your comfort zone has also been shown that that is hugely important uh, to your development, but also to your happiness. So there's a lot of research going on there and there's all kinds of ways on how we can look at curiosity. Now I might get a bit technical because we're gonna pin curiosity down a bit and we're gonna open up for uh, questions. We're gonna do a bit of an exercise and I'm probably gonna call on some of you because, and please also feel free to interrupt and ask questions while I speak or come with because there's a pretty uh, accomplished and curious 
people uh, in this group. So feel free to make this a conversation. So I have some stuff that just kind of to lay the ground and then we're gonna have Q and A and we'll have a lot of fun and we'll do some dancing. And if you want to an upright, we might do a curiosity meditation um, and go down maybe to your underworld and find your spirit animal or something like that if you want to. I think that would, be, uh, that would be amazing. And I would say that if, if people have questions, I'm gonna ask you to just let, let Anna do a little bit um, of explaining curiosity. And then if you have a question, do, raise your digital hand, um, which is in the reactions button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, rather than you know um, sort of jumping out with anything. So if you raise your digital hand, I will see you and then I'll moderate some Q&A once Anna's had a chance to tell us about curiosity. Anna, just tell us when you first became curious about curiosity. Um, actually, I, I mean, when I look at curious, we are since we're born, but curious by curiosity is when I started, I'm a research nerd, so I read a lot of research. And it's when I realized that wherever you angle curiosity, it kind of is the holy grail for longevity and happiness in so many ways. So curiosity is one of those magic pills that hasn't got the claim that it should have. So I, I would say probably the past 10, 15 years, I've been into the field of curiosity and I almost mention it on every talk I have, every live, whatever I do, I always mention curiosity because I think it's not practiced enough. And there's reasons for it not being practiced enough because, um, which I will go through. So um, shall I start? Great. I'll start. And so, I mean, and I love Albert Einstein. He has a quote saying, the important thing is not to stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existing. And I think we kind of sometimes do not question enough in the world. And if you define curiosity, and here's where the difficulty is, but it's a quality related to inquisitive thinking, such as like, you know, like exploration, investigation and learning. So when we consider human development, curiosity is a desire for learning and to acquire knowledge and skills. So there's really not a coincidence that it is a cornerstone of team development. And also it's, it's also one of those abilities to develop a natural wonder. So it is a motivator for learning, influential in decision-making, and it's also crucial for healthy development. So the interesting thing with career, it's just a basic component of our nature is that we are nearly sometimes oblivious to its importance in our life. Consider the, how much of our time we spend seeking and consuming information, whether it's listening to the news or music, browsing the internet, reading books or magazines, watching TVs, movies, etc. So, and when you decrease curiosity, it's a symptom of depression. Now, when you're too curious, you can be too distracted. I mean, my partner guy, he is incredibly curious. And the problem is that he's also curious when he drives the car. So <laughs> he, my kids don't always want him to drive. He says, let mom drive instead. Because he can say, oh, an elk. He's always on the use because we live in Sweden and he's from Australia. So he thinks elks are incredibly novel and, and interesting to look at. But that is where curiosity can also, and that's why curiosity killed the cat is where that's from. Um, and we'll go through, you have two types of curiosity. Generally, you have perceptive curiosity, like when you're like, like guy, sounds like he's a child, he's a child. My kids have to actually sometimes says you have three kids now, mom, instead of two. But when you're curious about anything, how things work, whatever, and it doesn't have a direct relationship to you, that's one type of curiosity. Then you have specific curiosity. That's people like myself. And those are people, uh, and many of you, the scientists or others that you're curious in one field, whether it's wellness or mechanics or inventions or whatever it is. So there's these two, of course, all of us have both, but then you can see that generally people have a bit of, of each. So I'm more the specific curious person and Guy is more um, the, the perceptive that is curious about everything. But what we have seen from research is that curiosity helps us to survive because the urge to explore and seek novelty 
helps us to remain vigilant and gain knowledge about our constantly changing environment. And I think we've had a lot of changing environment the past couple of years. And you can see if you've been curious instead of fearful, what's going to happen now? How, are we, how am I going to deal with staying at home? What's this is interesting. Let me look at this a retreat instead of a prison. It's just being a curious nature. It really helps us to survive. Uh, it's also been shown that curious people are happier. So research has shown that curiosity to be associated with higher levels of positive emotions, lower levels of anxiety, more satisfaction with life, and a greater psychological well-being. So it's it's there is a bit of a dichotomy there because some people say that if you're happy, you're curious. So the question is, what comes first, the chicken and the egg, curiosity or happiness? But it also boosts achievement that curiosity leads, and I see that we have some Renee and workplace wellness, but it's that curiosity leads to more enjoyment and participation in schools and higher academic achievements, as well as greater learning, engagement, and performance at work. And I was reading a piece about curious leaders and that leaders who are curious, meaning that they listen more, they allow for more open-ended question, build much stronger teams instead of those that are a bit more, I'm right, you're wrong, more judgmental, and we've already tried that, we're not gonna go there. So that's another. We also know that curiosity can expand empathy. And I think that's incredibly important in this world where we have a greater polarity, I think, than ever. And a lot of you are from the US, you have Republicans against Democrats, but I also think what I've seen, and, and it's not that I, I want to get into the vaccine debate, but you see the pro and the against vaccine vaccinated and not being empathetic. And if you're curious of thinking, why is that person thinking like that? And I think like this, and then you can actually have more empathy. And that's what the world is needing. And there are, is a website. I'm going to try to find it because I lost it just before this call because I accidentally deleted it. But I was going to show you there that you can go in and debate. Uh, you can have an atheist with a Christian to debate God or non-God. So there's a lot of interesting things how you can do to actually elevate your curiosity. It helps strengthen a relationship because obviously one study asked strangers to pose and answer personal question. Um, and it's a process that scientists, because there's some scientists here, call reciprocal self-disclosure. Disclosure. Found that people were rated as warmer and more attractive if they showed real curiosity in the exchange. And then it improves healthcare. It's been shown that doctors that are generally curious about their patient's perspective are, are better doctors. So that's kind of obvious. Um, so that's just something to talk about. Now, why is the curiosity as big as it should be? It should be our hero. It's because the scientist has a difficulty to actually define what curiosity is. So the lack of a single widely accepted definition of the term. Um, many observers think that curiosity is a special type of the broader category of information seeking. But carving out a formal distinction between the curiosity and information seeking has been proven difficult. So as a consequence, much research that is directly relevant to the problem of curiosity does not use the term curiosity and instead focuses on what is considered to be like uh, play, exploration, reinforcements, learning, latent learning, et cetera. So that is one of the reasons why curiosity doesn't, because scientists cannot really agree um, if, if actually uh, what curiosity is. And then there is many levels of curiosity. So think about it this way. You can have uh, curious about something that's very safe or curious where does curiosity and risk take her? So if you have a child, for instance, and you ask them to choose between a safe door and a risky door. Now, if the child chooses a risky option, is the child curious or is she risk seeking? Because if you're too risk seeking, curiosity can be dangerous. It can kill the cat. So these are things. So it's, it's it's also, and also the science can be very manipulative. So, uh, and 
what also has been shown, let's say that you have two paths to choose from, that you don't know which either, which where it would lead. One path A, you will you can get a reward, let's say $100. And you're quite certain that you maybe probably reach the $100 that are taking that path. Path B, you can get $1,000, but the uncertainty is a lot greater that you will actually get those $1,000. So research has shown that we generally, our brain chooses the safest way. And, and that means that we choose the safer way, we actually lower our curiosity. And even very simple animals trade off information for rewards or trade off curiosity. Now, just to complicate, and I'm just trying to show why curiosity is not more widely talked about in the science, although it is becoming much more, is that there is a link between dopamine and curiosity, but it's debatable. Brain scans have shown that when we get information through curiosity, it means that actually the things that light up in our brain is the learning centers instead of the reward center. And dopamine is coupled to the reward center. So uh, I'm getting slightly technical here, but I just kind of want to give you a bit of a round um, um, and you're right, Stefania, we may choose a safer option when our basic needs are not covered. And I think, yes, but even when our basic needs are covered, we so want to be in the know. We want to be right. Uh, and that's one of, of the issues. And when we're young, we're so curious. And as we get older, it goes down. And it actually goes down quicker for men than for women, just as a curious tidbit. Um, you know, Anna, the, can I, let me just ask you something. Um, first of all, I'll be interested to know if there are ongoing research studies now that you're aware of that are studying this, they're looking into the science behind this. But one thing is certain, and that is that we all encourage through schools, through our home, through everything, we encourage children to be curious. We, we, it's a huge part of learning. Um, as a child, but as we age, that, you know, definitely leaves as something that we encourage in workplaces and, you know, in, in, you know, in general. And I wonder if you have thought about how you integrate curiosity into the work you do. Do you integrate it in your workforce? Do you integrate it at your, you know, as part of programming? Do you encourage curiosity now as a tool? Because you have said that curiosity is a holy grail for health. So how do we get people to engage in this more um, when they're not in elementary school where it's encouraged? Well, it starts, I mean, it, to answer the first question, how I work in teams in my team is that, or my teams, I, I have three different teams at Six Senses. So it's kind of different purposes. But we have one called the WIT team, the Wellness Innovation Team, but we're very witty. And uh, our organizational structure is a round circle, which confuses our big uh, IHG company because they don't see these uh, structures. But I don't want a boss. I want everyone to be on a circle so we can have very open conversation. So, and it actually fosters just by having an organizational structure. We do something called that I think many of you know, design thinking. We use that method uh, because that fosters a lot of curiosity. We also do some, uh, when I do work, like brainstorming workshops with our GMs, uh, general managers in our hotels, because they can be, be like, they're like kings of a kingdom, a GM. And they could go like paint this wall pink and everyone will paint the wall pink if they want to. It's kind of exhilarating to be a general manager. So to have them to brainstorm and be out of their comfort zone because they're, used to being the, the king of, of the castle, so to speak, is not that easy. So we often do different exercises. One that I love doing, which is really fun, is that you take an A3 paper with full of circles and you do a competition where you're supposed to do as many different things, uh, circles, you need to fill them with paintings uh, in one minute. And you're not allowed to do different times of the clock. You can do one clock, right, usually, but you do a pig and you can do all kinds of things. But what happens is that you open up, research shown that you open up the brain. Um, so, so that's one way, it's to change how they normally work. What I do when I do curiosity stuff on uh, Teams is 
that when we discuss something and everyone that works with me usually have pen and paper because I can suddenly say, let's draw this question. Like, and then they say, but how do I draw it? Well, just do a painting. And suddenly, I mean, and I cannot draw, but suddenly when everyone shows in front of the camera, completely new things. So it's really breaking that thought pattern that straightforward pattern, bilateral, going up dancing, uh, doing a visual brain and like a meditation, all kinds of things can actually help. So I think, it, and it starts with actually asking the question, why? Why is this like this? And when you are angry at someone, I think that's the most important thing is, is why does this person make me angry? So, and that's another, it's a set, asking why all the time why is this person saying what he's saying why is this politician acting like the way he does i mean it can be all kinds of things but asking the question why i think is really important but i i don't know i mean renee um i'll call you out because you're our workplace wellness queen um when it comes to curiosity what do you do oh i'm not sure i can take on the designation of workplace wellness queen, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I would think for, for leader and team development, there's a whole host of things. And, and a lot of it is what you're saying, Anna, helping people learn how to ask um, more open-ended questions, helping people get comfortable to ask questions where you're not seeking an answer, but you're ask, actually seeking possibility um, helping people to learn how to, and when I say people, including ourselves, me included, do more deeper listening, not just listening for what's stated, but for sort of the deeper cues, signals, so that's a level of curiosity. Uh, naming certain meetings, so saying, you know, when we come to this meeting, we're not looking for a solution, this is going to be our, our brainstorming or our creativity or our strategic meeting. So helping people come already prepared to, to really open up and to use not just their heads, but their heart insight and their physical somatic insight. Um, so those are just a couple, intuition, helping people bring their intuition to work, which some, some, so many of us leave behind. Um, even in part of a meeting, you can be in a part of a meeting that you need to get to some conclusion, but you say for the next 20 minutes, it is no holds bar. We're really gonna open up and, and everyone, we wanna hear everyone's voice. We wanna generate as many ideas. So the quantity of ideas often will get to quality of ideas. So it is a practice because so many of us, like Anna was saying, um, Nancy, you mentioned children, around age seven, at least in US school systems, around age seven is when we see curiosity dive. And it's, it's when we've been in the school system for about a year. And then we start to, our curiosity, our sense of wonder, awe, appreciation, growth mindset, all those things are related, start to really dive. So we're really training as adults how to engage what is a natural resource within us. You know, we're physically hardwired to be curious. Thank you. And it's so, I mean, especially we are hardwired, but as we age, which is, uh, we, that declines and we think we know things. Yeah, there is this thing about waking up every day with the beginner's mind and uh, that we hear a lot about. And I think that's very important. And what they've seen that curious older people, they have better memory, better health. I spoke to a brain researcher because I asked, what is the number one thing you can do to keep your brain healthy when it comes from cognitive way, not going out walking and eating the right and breathing? And he said that it's about learning new things all the time. He said the best way, Sudoku and crosswords, no, it's not that's going to make you not get Alzheimer's or other brain degenerative diseases. But actually, if you learn constantly, you have to learn things that you're really crap at, that you're bad at. So he said the best way to ensure that you keep your brain healthy is that you learn a new language throughout your life. So start learning Chinese when you're 80 and you will ensure your brain just kind of snaps at it. Also doing anything of artistry is important because it, again, it crosses over. So learning to play the piano, painting, all of those things is, is also very important to keep your brain healthy because I think one of the most scariest thing as we grow older is to lose our brain and we see people around us who do that and there's nothing worse. So I think um, uh, my goal is to learn Spanish 
this year, which everyone should know, know these days. But I, I just thought I'll give, I've downloaded Duolingo and I'll give it five minutes a day and who knows. David, you have your hands up. Yes, and I'm just gonna say that David um, and anybody who wants to contribute, just give us, just say your name, where you're from, and then you've got under a minute to ask a question of Anna. Under a minute, eh? Hello, yes. Anna. Um, yeah, no, I was interested in, well, curious about um, this idea that we, we lose this capacity as we age, which suggests that there's a kind of a pathology going on there. But, do you, but is this just something that we're tied to more as a social construct, as we sort of just become comfortable in our society, in our communities, in our society, or in our roles, rather yes. than an actual pathology to losing this capacity? It is uh, both, I would say, um, because we have a different type of curiosity when we're young and it changes as we grow older. But what research shows and also is that when we are expert, we, when we feel that we're expert in something, uh, then we know it all. And then we don't often also want to be questioned. So we want to be right. So I think that's the issue is, is and as this world has developed lately or the last, I would say it's not just the pandemic, but before is that you're right, I'm wrong, or I'm right, you're wrong. That has become such a prevalent. And when you do that, when you practice that, your curiosity just, I mean, your depression comes and uh, your health goes down, your happiness goes down. So there is, been, it's a very cultural where we're basically think that we know it all and we want to know it all. And then we listen to the news. And it's so interesting. You have BBC or CNN and then you have Fox News and they're saying completely two different things. And and the question is, who's right? Who knows? Uh, it doesn't matter. But whoever listens to right, uh, whichever one is convinced that they're right. Yeah, I haven't watched the news for five years now. So um, I'm probably one of the happiest people you'll ever meet. You know. That's right. Okay, thank you, David. And I would say that that's I know Susie and I we always say that too to people. We're not we're not focusing on the news, and that's why we're able to remain optimistic and and do thank all you, that we do. Thank you. Okay, Shivani, you have your hand up. We need to see your face if you're going to speak, and um, also just tell us where you're calling in from. And short question for Anna. Sure. Thank you so much, Nancy. I'm from Bombay, India. And my quick question, Nancy, is that as I'm, uh, you know, sitting here listening to you talking about uh, curiosity, one thing that comes to my mind is uh, the word courage. Do you think courage is what's important uh, for us to be curious? Because as adults, we have to know so much. You know, as kids, it's okay to not know. But as adults, when we go for an interview, uh, we would be asked for a five-year plan need to know what we are doing as individuals, what uh, our plan is. Our kids always want to know the answers to so many questions. Uh, and it's not very easy to actually say, I don't know the answer to that uh, as adults. So do you think courage is something that comes as a prerequisite uh, to curiosity, especially as adults? Anna, does courage, is courage part of curiosity? It is said, and Brene Brown has talked about curious curiosity and courage, because being curious is basically saying uh, that you're not, you're potentially not right. That means that you're vulnerable. So you have to have courage. So there is a link, and she has had some interesting articles between it, but I definitely think that you have to, and it's one thing just to relate to this, another study said that what they saw that if they gave, I don't know, can't remember, it was 50 people, they gave them the task of doing one new thing every day. And it could be take a different road to work, eat something they haven't tried before, whatever it could be, not putting on TV in, at night, well, whatever it could be is, but something small or something big. And what happened when they looked at these is that everyone who was overweight had lost considerable amount of weight uh, and it was very interesting. And also that they were happier. They felt they had more control over their life. And it's kind of a courageous thing to not do the same every day. So there is a definitely, I think it's a really good question. And there has been 
links between curiosity and courage. And I think I like Brene Brown because she talks a lot about vulnerability. And there she says that to be vulnerable, and that's one of the issues with loneliness, which is not today's topic because that we could speak on forever, is to be dare to be vulnerable. So I think curiosity is incredibly important. And there are signs that shows that it has links. Thank you so much. Thank and you so much, Shivani, and thank you, Anna. Eric, same, unmute and tell us where you're calling in from and take less than a minute and ask a question of Anna. Let's do that. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I'm calling from Portugal. And my question uh, is about this notion of curiosity. How can we encourage people to remain curious and use emotional intelligence when modern technology, especially attention economy, is pushing us to change our daily behaviors and psychocognitive abilities? Everyone, no exceptions to me, especially in the hotel ecosystem, uh, because at the moment, the, uh, the, the hotel ecosystem is shifting towards an even more tech presence. And um, so I'm very curious because I know that Anna is a pioneer in the world of wellness. I have lots of respect for that, but I definitely want to understand how can we really get to, to, to let people understand the necessity to be curious and of course, uh, use emotional intelligence. Thank you. It's a very difficult question. I mean, that was a very high level how we can actually uh, inspire because yes, technology, te but technology can also help to keep people curious because it could kind of dumb us down and do the dopamine where we just reward watching TikTok after TikTok and just get this uh, dopamine center. But I think it, it, it's a very difficult question. I think it's more about cultivating kids, school system and asking the question why being the only thing to do is that whatever you do as a person, when you work in a team or as a leader or as a person, is to yourself be curious. And I do think that when it comes to technology and curiosity is that we're seeing that people are starting to use technology different, I have to say, is that they're taking away before five years ago, there was always mobile phones at dinner table and, and other things. We can see that that's not taking place anymore at, at successes, actually. We're doing now where we put a box in the middle of the table to put your mobile phone in and instead you take out conversations cards that has curious questions saying what was the best thing that happened to you the past month or things like that and then, then people think and then you start a discussion and so so i think there are ways that we can lead by example but it is a very difficult question because technology and the news and TikTok and Instagram and all these things kind of dumb us down instead of being curious. And the, the worst thing, and I think one of the biggest issue, and my kids hate when I say they're teenagers, so it doesn't have, I can't say anything to them any longer, but when they're bored and I say, that's the best thing you can be for your development. And they're like, we hate you saying that, just give us our phone or watch the TV so they don't have to be curious. So it is, we have a curiosity problem right now. I agree. And it's such a difficult question, but I think it's an important one, but I can't say I have the answer unless anyone else has the answer here. Okay, that's it. Very good, Eric, thank you. Um, thank you. And is it Hani um, next? Uh, same, tell us where you're calling in from and a quick question for Anna. Uh, hi, I'm calling from Chile. Uh, um, I would like to know if you agree um, Anna, about the, the in some way, is a, the curiosity is a, is on a state of mind. Um, it's like when you listen to music, when you are practicing um, a spa, and then gather trigger dopamine, and and it, that is one thing. And the other thing I would like to know if you agree about the um, as we age, you you not it's not declining. The, the interest, I think, is changed a lot, and there is a different focus, more uh, spirit, spirituality. You, you are more focusing in, in, in what is coming after life. It's, it's changing, not that I think. When you have the attitude all your life, it's changed through this uh, different um, perspective. Hey. So the first question, yes, I agree um, that it is a state of mind because you can either have this creative mindset of being open 
or you can close it. It's it's kind of like open the curtains or close the curtains. Uh, so I think it is a state of mind. But also what has been shown though, I have to say another research uh, study about kids is that every child is very curious, but when they saw that children who were innately more curious than others, when they looked into them 10 years later, they were had 10 more points, if I remember, in IQ scores, they scored better in schools. So I think there are some, and you can see that with kids, some kids are just so curious that you, you want to tell them to stop asking questions, whereas other kids are more introverts. So I think it's, it's very much, it's both a state of mind, especially when we get older, but you're innately predispositioned by the, how you are, like you like balls or you're curious. So there's both of those. And the second question I didn't really get. Can you tell me that? One I, I want to just say, I want to just say, I want to get one question from everybody because we had a lot of hands raised and I'm watching the time. So okay. I mean, thank you so much. And um, and let's keep the questions short and the answers short so that Anna can lead okay, us in a curiosity meditation, which she has promised. So um, right. Ranga, over to you. Right. Okay, thank you. Uh, wonderful topic. And I say this because if I had to- Just a question, just a question, please. Yes, exactly. So curiosity and imagination have been the prime drivers of my happiness and well-being state. Where do you see the connection? And to add to the question, just I'll rise slowly. I'll give you the five questions I have, which again, form a part of my daily life. I hope you like these aspects. <laughs> so to add, add to the why, it's also who, which, why, where, when, who's. <laughs> Those are fabulous. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. That was brilliant. Okay, imagination and curiosity. And, oh, imagination and curiosity. I got so much in, in trained with the t-shirt. Um, imagination and curiosity. I think curiosity fosters imagination. So, uh, but it could, again, it's where scientists debate which comes first, happiness or curiosity, imagination or curiosity. Both are linked. Um, so I would say definitely because you can't imagine anything unless you're curious. But if you're curious, you can't imagine stuff. So I think probably curiosity comes first. And I'm going to ask you that when we send out the, the email, which we do following these calls with all kinds of important links and information, um, as well as the recording and the chat, I'd love you to give us um, some research, some links to some research on curiosity that we can include, because I know there is science around this. Um, you've been quoting all kinds of studies. It would be good to have some of that hard scientific evidence as part of our follow-up. So we'll follow up with you to get those links. Um, yes. Stefania, let's hear your question. Hello everyone from uh, Dubai, United Arab Emirates. Okay, so my question is the link between curiosity and purpose and passion. The reason why I'm asking that is because I work in two different fields, one being marketing, the other being well-being. So I test daily how curious I am towards one and the other. And definitely the one that I'm passionate about, that is my true calling, that is my purpose, which is well-being, makes me go that extra, extra, extra mile to be willing to know more, to be willing so to- So the connection between people. purpose and passion and curiosity. Yes, it is necessary okay. to feel the, the, the passion towards a topic, to be curious. Or do you think we can be curious about something that we don't have any interest? Yes, we can be curious of things that we have no interest of. That's the perceptual curiosity where you're just curious generally of how does that work? How does that, it doesn't have any relationship to us, but we're just generally curious and find things interesting. People that know a lot of things, you have you all have those in your life that kind of seem to know all kinds of strange things is because they're curious just generally without being passionate. So I think it doesn't have to have a relationship, but of course, if you're curious, a specific curiosity as we talked about before in a special field you also become very passionate and that could become your purpose so it could have but it depends on what type of curiosity you're practicing and we both practice both and we all practice both 
but it, everyone is a bit different. So you can have both, I would say. I'm gonna take the two more questions with the hands raised and then we're gonna do a meditation. Sarah Jones. Hi, Sarah of Spa and Wellness Mexico, Caribe Magazine in Playa del Carmen, Mexico. Um, I am wondering about what you said about with people who have a growth mindset versus people who have a very fixed mindset. Is there a way to encourage populations en masse to become more open to new information? And I understand that's kind of what we're trying to do here, but are there any strategies for helping large numbers of people become more open? Um, I haven't seen any strategies because of the reason of that the people with a lot of um, politicians as well as media doesn't want us to become more open because they want to buy whatever they're selling, whatever. Uh, so I think a lot of what we hear, the large strategies are not, are not encouraging it. But I would say leadership today is encouraged. Is encouraged. If you look at, um, oh my God, uh, with leading well from within, what's his name, Nancy? Um, um, oh my God, um, died in cancer. Our wonderful, amazing guy. Oh, oh Danny, Danny Friedland. Danny. Danny Friedland, thank you. His book, Leading Well From Within, he talks a lot about reactive mindset and creative mindset. And I think a lot of leadership books and Danny Friedland of many have really worked on from a leadership perspective, have this creative mindset. But I think big strategies is difficult with the way our world is right now, where everyone wants to have their message across. And whatever is right or wrong, it doesn't matter, but that's and who controls those messages, so to speak. Yeah, makes sense. Thanks. Thank you, Anna. And the last question goes to Angel, if you will put on your video and um, ask a short question of Anna. And my apologies, my camera is not working on, but I just, the question is uh, uh, from the United States. I just wanted to ask regarding um, ADHD and um, curiosity. Is there a certain part of the brain that's being activated, or is it are you seeing people being able to help others with it? I'm, I was just curious. A good, curious question. And yes, it actually is. Uh, it says that people, uh, kids or people who are too curious, that they're ex doing it too much, they have attention deficit disorder because they're curious about everything. So this is one reason, this is what they've seen is that being less, too little curious makes you depressed. Over curious means that you get an attention deficit disorder like Guy has when he drives, but otherwise he doesn't. Uh, so, so just, he's gonna, I'm glad he's not on this call. But anyway, uh, He's a very accomplished guy and curious, but no, so, so yes, there is a link and it's simply is you have to, it's that uh, Khalil Gibran has that poem saying between passion and water, you have to do everything in moderation or like Ayurveda says. Now you want me to do the meditation. Is that correct, Nancy? I would love you to do the meditation. How many minutes do I have? Because we're going to do dancing. You have uh, 10 minutes and then we're going to turn it over to Lisa Fazulo. Actually, okay. now you have 45, 50. Yeah, let's say eight. How about eight minutes? No, I can do eight minutes. We're going to go and do okay. a fun, curious meditation. Now, in order to do this, and you can close your eyes already now, is that you have to open up your imagination and open your brain for experiences that might not be possible in this physical world, but in our imagination world, anything is possible so imagine yourself walking in a forest and in this forest there is this tree the world tree and it's so big so its branches reaches up to the sky and you are able to merge with this tree so you can just walk right into it and suddenly you're in the middle of the trunk and you decide that you want to go down, you want to follow the roots down to the earth. So you're able to do this because you are light and liquid, so you can do anything you want. So you start descent down to earth. You see the earth, the roots, the stones, the fungi, the mushrooms, the mycelium, and you go a bit deeper down. You get through the base of the mountains and down to water. And you come to this lake of water. 
it is a cleansing water and you can just look around and see what you see. Are there flowers or are there trees? What is around this beautiful lake of yours, your own lake of cleansing water? You decide to take a dip into the lake and you see an opening at the lake and you just feel how refreshing and cleansing this water is, but you go, you swim towards the opening and it's like a stream and you follow the stream and you can just kind of float down and you go further down and the stream bumps up and downs, it curves, comes a little waterfall and you just lightly drop down in the waterfall and the stream continues further and further down into earth. And then you end up in a bigger lake and you see a shore. So you swim to the shore, it's a sandy shore and you walk up there and there's a big, big stone. And there is a garment for you to wear and you put it on. And suddenly this old man appears. And he says, we're here to meet your spirit animal. And you're kind of thinking, where is it? Where is it? And the, the old man says, and he looks into your eyes, don't look. Because it's right behind you. And you want to turn around, but you don't. Now I want you to have a conversation with this man. Just hear what this man has to say to you. And then... In a couple of seconds, it's time for you to turn around and just see what that animal is. You look into their eyes. So if you turn around now, look into the eyes and see what animal is there for you. Now, as you see this animal, whatever it may be. You ask the animal what it has to tell you. And see whatever message you get. You might wanna invite the animal into your body to be part of you and merge because anything is possible. Now it's time to say goodbye to your power animal that came to you today. You turn around, say thank you to the old man and you put your garment on the stone and you dive in to the lake. And as imagination has, the stream brings you upwards all the way up through the waterfall, further up to your little lake that you can always visit at any time. You ascend through the earth, through the mycelium, up into the tree trunk. You step out of the tree trunk and you're back into your chair where you're sitting now. And when you're ready, open your eyes. Thank you. So we, I did that pretty quickly. Now, if you would like to, and sometimes it can be hard to see the animal and then you can just take whatever an animal you like. But if you want to, you can share in the chat what animal that you saw because it's pretty. And if you even want to go further, I am also, I work as, uh, I don't work as, I do it on my free time as shaman. So I work with the tribes in South America and I'm in Chile frequently. Uh, but and Peru so that is a typical way of doing kind of an indigenous meditation a bit commercialized but if you're interested if whatever you saw you can also search that animal up in spirit animal and see Ooh, jaguar that's bear oh this is so cool so 
look them up as spirit animal, a uh, bear spirit animal or something, and you'll find a lot of interesting information because it's probably something you need to hear. So be curious, even though it sounds a bit airy fairy and not as scientific as we've been so far. So here we go. Anna, that was unbelievable from start to finish. Um, I want to say that this is a little window into Anna Bjurstrom and how you work and the kind of secret sauce of Anna. I mean, you are so known for your creativity and your creative thinking, your innovation. I'm serious. And these are tools you use in your life and in your work that get you to a very different place than many people go in work that is similar to your work. So I think it is a real window into how you do what you do, why you are so accomplished. Um, and, and that curiosity is such a through line for you. And it has been for a long time. Um, before we um, move to dance, I would just ask everybody to Unmute for a moment and give Anna a great deal of love and gratitude for taking us on this journey through curiosity today. Thanks, Anna. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anna. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Bravo, bravo. Thank you. Wait. Thank you, Anna. So thank you, thank you. And so now, if you will all thank mute you, yourselves Anna. again, uh, all mute yourselves again, I will turn it back to Jesse and to Lisa Fazulo to dance us out of our moonshot call and happy full moon, everybody. Jesse. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you so much, Anna. Last and certainly not least, we close our program with Lisa Fasulo, founder and director of the Center for Transformative Movement. Her moonshot in motion is a practice that you can plan into your day to feel more grounded, playful, and open to what's ahead. Hello, Lisa. Thank you for being here. Hello, Jesse. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Excellent. So what a nourishing call. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Um, interestingly, I love words and notable that the word curiosity comes from the root word cure, meaning um, healing or successful treatment. And so that's really interesting. And it segues into today's Moonshot in Motion, where I'm going to be sharing with you a two minute movement practice that activates all of the characteristics that we've been talking about today. And it brings them up and has you feel them. So playfulness, curiosity, confidence, and energy. So before we start the music, let's everyone stand up and... Uh, and what we're gonna be doing is expressing and representing the different types of curiosity and feeling accomplished. So one, we will be just lifting our arms from our shoulders. Instead of just going up, let's go, oops, let's go up, elbows and up and then out. So it's like up and it's, these are representing the curiosities and the accomplishments that we see. They're more tangible, what we perceive. So up and out and we'll be moving. The next one out of the three is just the inner one. Some more subtle ones, giving ourselves a hug that we've been feeling or feel unfolding within us, around us. And the third one is just that exuberance of being that we talked about, of being curious, Ranga mentioned it, of just life. So we have one that's up and out. We have one that's more subtle and we just move to it. And we have just the exhilaration of being alive and being curious. So let's Jesse start the music. And we'll start with going through each one and then we'll just open it up. So, and feel free to turn up your own volumes if you'd like to get the music louder. I, I think uh, Jesse, it should be a different one. Rock your baby. It's the karaoke version of yeah, Rock. I, I get it. I, I know it. we did the sound check. I have it open and everything, and something else started playing. <laughs> okay, so while Jesse's finding that, let's let's just start with looking once again. So up and out, and you can step back and forth. You can twist. 
and you can move your hips. You can do anything. It just helps sometimes to have a little bit of guidance back and forth while we're doing our upper let's body just motion. Use this. Let's just use this, Lisa. Sorry. Go ahead. That's okay. I don't know what happened with the one that I put We'll be curious about it. Okay, can you get a little bit louder? Sure. Okay, so let's go. Oh, good. Up. And snap. You can close your eyes if you want and just really experience that. What you're seeing around you. What you're a part of. What you're working toward. Moving your head. And now let's move into that more subtle feeling of accomplishment, of our curiosity we get to have. Good. And then out. Just the feelings around us. Good. Just take it away now. Whatever moves you up. Letting your whole body sink into it. No right way or wrong way. So this can be done as we're doing now to more rhythmic slow music or more dynamic music depending on what mood you're in. So just up, inward, and everything around us. This helps to ground and give us access to all those feelings within us opens up the circuit. Instead of just having it be all internal, it opens it up, connects us with it for the rest of the day or for the rest of the evening. So keep dancing. We want to say thank you for everyone. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Have a good rest of your day or good night. And we look Thank you, everybody. Feel free to unmute and, unmute and say goodbye. It was great to see you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 It was a pleasure to see everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye. Bye bye. Good day. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you. This was awesome. This was super, super awesome. Love, love, love. Bye bye.